Hey, Sterile Barbecue Superstars, and we're here with the one and the only Red Bordner. And uh, a little bit of history is fixing to change Red. And I know you might be selling your shop and all, and uh, we wanted to come by today and uh, get a big piece of history and wanted to give everybody an opportunity to meet Red and hear his story. Now, we've got barbecue and NASCAR going together in a big way with Red here. And, uh, Red, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got started in NASCAR. Well, I started, uh, well, I started dirt track racing back in the, in the 70s in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, Cumberland County Motor Speedway and uh, Fayetteville Motor Speedway. And uh, we just, uh, you know, and then 85, well, well, in 79, I moved to South Carolina after I got out of the Army and uh, I quit dirt track racing in 76 and I didn't race again until about 82, somewhere along in there, and a couple buddies of mine asked me to go drive a car. And I went and drove a car to Newberry Motor Speedway in uh, <laughs> Metropolitan City of Newberry. And then I, I built a dirt, I built, I built me a little dirt track Camaro, and we got out and played and raced and went to, we'd race in the Columbia, the New Columbia Motor Speedway down in Gaston and uh, Sugar Creek and Buffalo. Buffalo was, I call it the Dust Bowl. It was just round and round and round. There wasn't no straightaways, I don't think, down there. <laughs> and the water truck always broke about halfway through water. <laughs> about halfway through the race, they'd red flag it because there was so much dust you couldn't see who was in front of you. But we had a ball down there in Sugar Creek, down in Union, and uh, we'd go to uh, Monk's Corner once in a while. And uh, a lot of times we was in Batesburg, Leesville, or down in Lawrence. And uh, oh Lord, you raced in Lawrence, you was on death row down there. <laughs> They they allowed to take you out any lap. Even the guy you lapping take you out, you know. He didn't like you, he'd take you out, but that was, a, that was some fun racing. But you know, dirt track was pretty good, but you know, your car stayed wrinkled all the time, you know. I never was a clean spot on it. I think the hood with the hood and the and the top of the own plate didn't have a wrinkle on it. And sooner or later it got wrinkled. But, but you know, we uh and uh and then uh in 1985, I just quit. I, I just, I give it up, and uh, I got tired of being banged around, and tore up cars all the time, and so I quit. And uh, some of my buddies, when I moved up here to Newberry, I mean from Newberry up to Spartanburg, we moved up to Lake Bowen, and my my neighbor, he was into this road course racing a little bit, and he built this MG Midget behind me here, and uh, and he and uh, I and his, his other uh, buddy Steve, he had a uh, he had a, a, a 27 Kodiak car that, uh, that Rusty Wallace had drove in, uh, in 89 that won the points championship against the number three car over there that, that Earnhardt had and, uh, that year. And uh, Rusty finished first and he finished second. Earnhardt finished second. And uh, they asked me to go with them. They was going to go racing. Well, like a fool, I said, yeah, I like to go. You know, I've been to racetrack since 85, and here it was in 99, somewhere along in that. So we went down the road to Atlanta, and Steve was having some vibration problems with his 27 Kodiak car, and, and the uh, and uh, Buddy was driving the MG Midget play with it, and he was having a lot of problems. So I went down there. I turned out to be a mechanic more than that. Didn't, didn't do no racing, but I went down there a mechanic with him, and I helped him, you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> and Buddy, Buddy asked me if I wanted to help put the, put the the MG Midget into the spotlight. So I said, Yeah, we'll put it in the spotlight. You know, we'll fix that thing up. So it took a lot of work. There was a lot of things, and and we worked on that thing. Went to Daytona and and raced down there, and, and uh, we was gonna run the endurance race together. I was gonna drive one. That they had two sprint races. I drive one. He drive one, and and and, and, and the thing and. Uh, but we uh, we finally put all the bugs to sleep on this uh, on this MG midget. And uh, matter of fact, back then it painted gold and black. And it was it was uh, Buddy and uh, his daddy and his son and his brother all went to Walford. And uh, so it was called it was gold and black like Walford Terrier. Matter of fact, they the terriers taped to the back window back there with the back row bar. I told anybody to beat me, they could have that terrier. So you know, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, we we were we were down there, and uh, first first big endurance race we raced in. You know, we uh, we had finally put the bugs to, to sleep. Uh, 
on that thing from running hot, cutting off, skipping, and doing all that. I mean, it was, and I've never worked on no SU carburetors, and and uh, and and I didn't know nothing about no MG midget motor, you know, no British made motor. I didn't. I've never worked on nothing like that. I was a Chevrolet man, you know, small block and, and Chrysler man mostly. So, so we put it to, put it out there, and we started. Out of 72 cars, I think it was something like that. We started 33. We was in the middle of the pack, and uh, and everybody was coming by telling us, you know, we need to buy this, and we need to buy that, and we need to do this. And well, you know, uh, my buddy Steve come over to me, you know, and he drove the Corvette and the and the Winston Cup car, and he told me, he says, "It's road course racing, just like any other racing. You you, you know, all I've done dirt track and drag race, you know." But I've done a little asphalt ramp, but all round and round. We've never done no road course race, changing gears, hitting the brake. And he told me, he says, uh, the last guy to put on the brakes at the turn and the first guy to put on the gas coming out of the turn is the guy that wins. He said, all you got to do is go up there and grow you some big bazookas. And he said, then you can win the race. He said, you don't need to spend all that money. He said, you spend $10,000 on a car and it won't go no faster because you can't drive it no faster. You got to know how to drive. You got to go out there and just drive the car. So thinking about that, and uh, we starting 33 out of 70 cars. So I think there's 72 cars in the race that day, in the endurance race. You know, it's a long, drawn-out thing, and uh, and uh, I figured they put me out there because I think I was the traffic control guy. You know, I could start off in the middle of the pack and not get killed. <laughs> you know, so we, I got out there, and the uh, next thing I know. You know, after halfway through the race, we come into pits, and they tell me we was in first place. <laughs> oh! I mean, how could you tell we was running around there? Of course, it was in our class. You know, there was a bunch of there was a bunch of real fast cars out there because they had two different groups racing in that same thing. But in our group of people, we was in first place. And uh, but the car was running good, wasn't running hot. It was smooth as silk, and you know, and and the handling was good. And uh, and I figured out that that brake pedal, you know, you really didn't need much brake out there. You just and that car there, you know, you, you know, Steve got it the first time he drove it, you know, and uh, he come back and told me, he said, you know, I could swore I seen an old tree out there on the backside. I've never seen that thing before, and I've been racing here for 10 years. <laughs> I said, oh, what? It ain't that slow. Uh, so, you know, but I guess going from 200 mile an hour to 140 mile an hour, you know, I guess, you know, you know, I, I guess you could you could see the difference, you know, and uh, and you could probably see something you ain't never seen before because you relaxed a little bit before you couldn't relax, you know. But then, uh, and then I, I picked up on the Earnhardt car over here, and uh, me and Steve, Steve and Randy and all of us, we put that thing together. And uh, matter of fact, the weekend that we had that car ready to go racing, and all we liked to do was put the stickers on it because we had to repaint it and we had to do all that stuff. Uh, that's the weekend that Earnhardt got killed. And, uh, oh. you know, that was a sad thing. And uh, we sat there and we had the big screen TV on and we was watching the race and put stickers on the car and we seen it happen. We was all out there watching the Daytona 500. And, and it was a sad moment for us because, you know, we thought that. Uh, you know, when, when Earnhardt was going to come to town, that year was the year they had the Bud Moore roast down at the Moore Auditorium, and Earnhardt planned on coming. We well, was going to take the car down there and let them all grab the dash for us, you know. And of course, you know that never happened. But, but we had a ball with that car, you know. The first race, uh, got the fender tore off, the quarter pound tore off of it. That's it up there. The uh, transmission in somebody's car broke, or line come loose or something, the car in front of us, got in the oil, and got it tore up. And, uh, Steve was driving when that happened and it broke your rib. Uh, whew, that hurt. And uh, and then, uh, of course, me and him played with it together for a little bit. And then, and then I just took it over. I took the MG over and everybody that didn't want to race, you know. And uh, me and Steve was on two left racing and he had the Corvette. He sold the 27 Kodiak car. I kept the three car. And then in uh, 2000, after John Finger, had raced the old three car. We bought that for a spire put up there, and uh, and so that's how we wound up with it. And uh, but uh, we've won a lot of races in that three car. Uh, matter of fact, about I'd say about 95 percent of what we what we've raced in. And uh, but yeah, we we picked up the old three car so we could have a a spire uh, that was originally the number 95 Caterpillar car that David Green 
uh, had on the pole at the Watkins Glen in, I think, 97. And then they sold it to the uh, Marine team, which was Bobby Hamilton Jr. Of course, David, I mean, uh, yeah, David Green had brake problems. He, I mean, when he wasn't in all that traffic out there, just, you know, when he, when he was out there qualifying, you know, well, you, you don't, you know, you don't need to break as much as you are when you're racing with a bunch of people and got to slow down more or whatever, you know. And, and plus, you're trying to be as fast as you can, so you should, like Steve said, you know, stay off the brake, right? <laughs> you don't need to brake, throw it out the window. But so, but when he got in the race, started having brake problems, and um, he went to the back of the pack. Uh, I don't remember where he finished that, but uh, he definitely set on the track record that day and set on the pole. And then uh, Bob and Hampton Jr. just used it for a backup car, and then they sold it to. Uh, Ever what that lady's name is that owns the Bush team, and she wanted to paint, paint it orange and yellow and red, and uh, put the old three on there. And John Finger drove it in the Bush race in uh, 2000 at Watkins Glen, and uh, he was in the back of the pack. He went towards the front and got up, I think, eighth place or somewhere up there, and he started having brake problem. Oh, but nobody didn't fix no brake problem. So I, when I had it, I asked John. I said, "How that thing run?" And, some people had told me they'd had some problems, and I was wondering what kind of problem was. Cause we bought they had a motor transmission rear end in it, but you know, but the brakes were still there, you know, and uh, and the, and the seat was gone, but everything else is there, you know, the radiators and all that stuff. And I will not know what kind of problem they had in it. And, and the crew chief for uh, for uh, John and, and him both had had brake problems, you know. And then I found out that David Green had brake problems, and then. I got to thinking, well, nobody didn't fix the brake, you know. So I went to looking at it, and sure enough, I seen what the problem was. I fixed it, and uh, and then uh, and then we won, we won about every race in it. We raced in except for one. Matter of fact, every race we raced except one, we won in it. Well, two. I take it back. We broke. We broke one time, uh, and uh, we finished second one time. Wow. And uh, yeah, in the Earnhardt car, we took it to Rockingham in '05. You know, I do a lot of cooking for Ryan Newman. A friend of mine hooked me up with Ryan Newman and uh, some of the people up there at NASCAR. That's really how I got hooked in with NASCAR was through uh, Steve, my buddy Steve, and uh, he hooked me up with uh, Matt McSwain, who happened to be the, back then was the main setup man for Ryan Newman. When he was getting all the poles and the track records and all that, he he worked for Penske back then, and uh, and uh, he wasn't the crew chief, Matt. He was the other Matt. And, uh, we hook up to him. He's one that sets up my cars and helps me. And he drives sometimes in the MG Midget with me. And he races old historic stock car too. I think he's got Jack Daniels 7 car, old 7 car. And, uh, but I got hooked up with them. And uh, I was up at Ryan's house and, uh, and Benny Parson was up there. We was up there cooking and Benny was there and Buddy Baker. And I, I don't remember. They, they were a big crowd of people. But, Benny told me so I'd take the call over there to Rockingham that weekend and next weekend because it was the last race of the season for NASA Pro Racing and I'd won every race I'd raced in that year. Uh, but I won the point championship. All I had to do was show up and get my point thing and they said if they're my title day and night, y'all take the car up there. I said, Well, okay, I'll take the car. And I got up there. I'm like a fool, I wanted to race and I was trying to hook up with them boys and get get everything lined up so I could be in the movie that night, right around the track well, that's where old Will Fair running around his underwear. I thought he's on fire. You, know? <laughs> oh, Lord, how much you I... were there and seen that? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he thought I was a ghost coming by. Day <laughs> running out the door. But anyway, but uh, that morning we went out there and uh, my crew chief, Rome, he stuck on some new sticker tires and, and uh, filled up the thing up with gas. Told me to go get my race suit on. So we got out on the racetrack and like a fool, them old Goodyear tires didn't stick too good. And next thing you know, I was in the wall. At Rockingham, so we wasn't in no movie. Didn't even get a chance to get in it, but we were, we had a good time that weekend, though. <laughs> Other than tying up the car, and that's when we put the old three car together. We that's when we put it together and started racing in. So, but yeah, we do a and barbecue, and you know that's something. Matter of fact, I went to a, a special event where they had a bunch of people out there trying to. Uh, matter of fact, it was uh, all the boys from Spartanburg signing autographs out at the fire grounds, you know, and had a big barbecue contest out there. And, and we took our race cars out there to try to help them raise money for the museum, you know. They were going to put the museum in Spartanburg. And, and we went uh, we went out there, and a buddy of mine was down there cooking in the barbecue contest. And I walked down and I said, Boy, this looks fun, you know. 
And um, I'd always like to cook at the house. I'd always like to make, especially make hash, you know. I like barbecue hash. Loved it since I was a little kid down in Greenwood. My grandmama lived down there. I used to go down there a lot and we'd eat a lot of hash down in Greenwood. That's the capital of the hash in the south. Man, we, I seen them back there cooking that barbecue and I was fascinated, especially when they started handing out awards. My buddy won most of it and there was some big money in that. I said, you know, I think I can get into this. You know, <laughs> I, I like to cook, you know. Like so that's, where you, fun, that's where your you know? barbecue roots started. Yeah, that's where the barbecue, the real barbecue roots started, you know. So, you know, but I always liked to cook when I was a kid, you know. I used to hang up, because when we moved to, uh, my mom and dad divorced when I was about six, and uh, we moved from Clinton, South Carolina to Black Mountain, North Carolina. And my great grandmama, who old hillbilly, you know, she was a real old country woman, you know, part Cherokee. And, and, uh, and of course, my great grandpa had already died in the time we moved up there, but it was Granny and my great granny and my mama and my two sisters. And when we moved in there, I thought I was the little man of the house, you know, because there wasn't no men in there. I was the only one, you know, six years old. And my great granny, I used to hang around over at the coattail, you know, and watch her cook. She cooked on a wood cook stove, you know. And I, you know, now that this day and time, you look back at that, see how fascinating that was, you know, to cook on the wood cook stove, all that heat and stuff in the house, you know. Of course, that's about the only heat we have is that that one in the little morning warmer in the in the in the, in the living room. That's all the heat they had. They went there to the bedrooms and nothing. And of course, the bathroom was outside his outhouse, you know. And only running water was at the kitchen sink in the in the uh, in the kitchen. That's the only running water we had. And uh, it was just the old country house and. Uh, but I used to hang around her and watch her cook, and my grandmama cook, and my grandmother down in, my grandmother down in, uh, in uh, Greenwood. She was from originally from uh, St. George area down in the lower part of the state. And uh, matter of fact, I'm kin to Jim Bowie that killed at the Alamo. Cause my great granny was a, a, on my my daddy's mama's side was a Bowie. I'm kin to them from down in the St. George area, and uh, you know they uh, they all like to cook. And you know that is some of the best eating I've ever done in my life has been around them old country people cooking different things, you know, and the way they season food and stuff, you know. Of course nowadays they tell you that key, you know, but you got to die something, my figure, you know. But <laughs> like barbecue, you know, <laughs> man, it's good. But Lord have mercy, and, it, and it, you know it's good for you. I think I think it's good for you. But, Me too. But I, you know, learning learning from her and like to fascinate them, and I like to experiment with different things, you know. And, You've eaten some of the things I've experimented yeah. with and cooked, and it's good pretty, stuff, it comes out pretty good. Mm. Matter of fact, this weekend down in uh, down in Waynesboro, we're going down to Waynesboro, Georgia, in the Boss Hall contest. They're going to have a strawberry contest on Friday night. They're going to give us out some strawberries. Want us to uh, fix a strawberry, you know, entry, you know. So I'm doing a strawberry daiquiri cheesecake. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, and making some strawberry stuff to go on top. Of it. You know thin, that's you know. gonna be good. That's yeah. gonna be a good, yeah. We do. So, but you know, it's racing. Uh, I love the need for speed. You know, I was in the Army Aviation for uh, the nice to guard time for about you know, I was in, I was in the guard about 12, 17 years, 15 years, somewhere in there. You know, most of all that was in aviation, down in McIntyre and helicopters. You know, and I, I love to fly, and uh, I love to race cars. And, I love to cook, and I mean, you know, longer it's a good time going on, it's fun, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was in Nice to Guard when they when they done away with the medevac unit is, and then all the things left was in Black Hawks and Apaches, and all they did stay in the woods and play, you know. I said, well, you know, the fun's going out of this, now it's time to go. <laughs> it's time to retire, so that's what I did. I retired because I seen the fun going out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And, of course, them, them boys, is, they've done, uh, ever since the, uh, Stuff started in Iran and Iraq. They, that's where they've been at. They constantly coming in and out and uh, everything. And uh, so, it, I might have stayed in and got in on some of that. That, that would have been fun to me. You know, where where the where the action was at. But you know, I'd already retired. And I didn't go back, so that was over with. But I, you know, as long as I'm having fun doing this stuff, I'm gonna keep doing it because it's you know it's a lot of fun. Now, I know you cooked uh, SCBA, South Carolina Barbecue Association, SBN, KCBS. Have you ever did a Indian? No, huh? I've never done one of them. And, uh, you know, I ain't too fond of them. Uh, some of them contests were, you know, you cook, you turn it in, and then they're going to come back and they're going to come to your site and judge you, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, we did that one time down in Charleston. 
And it, but it was a South Carolina Barbecue Association, but it did it like a Memphis in May. Okay. And uh, me and Dennis with Divine Smoke, you know Dennis, and mm -hmm. uh, and David from Smokehouse Cook, you know, down in, down there in Greenwood. We all went down there together, and uh, we we decided we'd just team up and went down there as Kickback Cove, and uh, we had that red trailer right there, and let me tell you, it down to Lousen. And I mean, there was a hundred cooking teams down there. And it was cold and rainy, and the wind was blowing. Oh. Well, well, you know, we in the trailer, so we didn't need no tent. And we didn't need nothing, but, you know, we just stayed in the trailer. I, you know, you just putting up a tent and blow away. Mm -hmm. And they know you, we cooking inside, so we ain't got to go outside. They'd have to open the windows on the trailer to cool it off, because it's cold. <laughs> so, you know, the heater, that, that, that big old smoker in the trailer kept it warm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they told us when they got down there, well, you turn in your stuff. And then, then the judges would come by, you know. So that means we had to serenade them, you know. And, and you know, a lot of times, in, you know, you, you think about these guys, you see them on TV and they're sitting up and they got all these dental plates and all these fancy napkins and all this stuff. Well, you know, I ain't into that, you know. I ain't a fancy kind of guy. You know, I might be crazy and wild, but I ain't fancy. <laughs> so, you know, so here they come, and what we done was, well, they had the whole hog judging first. Well, we, we ain't never cooked the whole hog competition. I cooked them in, the, in that rotis right there, but the hog I got was like, you know, 90 pounds, and I could stand him up on that rack and, and tie him off and then put some butts on the opposite rack of it or, or shoulders, bounce it out, mm -hmm. and take the racks out. Well... By cooking down there, you couldn't take the racks out because you had to cook other things too, ribs and all that, so you couldn't take all them racks out. So, and they give us a 120 pound hog and he ain't got no head on it. I've been cooking 90 pound hog with a head on so you know how small that can be, right? Mm -hmm. This thing's 120 pound, ain't got no, and I, my God, how we gonna get this thing on there? And me and David and, and Dennis, we'd wrestle that pig, we were down in that smoker, we looked like, <laughs> we looked like, we looked like we'd been through the war. You know, because, <laughs> And, we, and finally we just, and they had them butterflies wilted up and we washed that pig and we, we took five gallons of stuff and injected it in. <laughs> so we cut him down the middle, took him, cut him in half, put one half on one rack and a half on another rack and tied him off. So we had bang. Well, that's cool. So then we we'll cranked up and put on, on another rack, we put some shoulders, put on another rack, put some shoulders that night. We cranked that thing up. We went and got a shawl and everything and come back and then they went to the motel room and I stayed there and watched the cooker all night. And I'm laying there in the bed and all of a sudden, bloop, I heard something plop down in that cooker. I said, God, why did my hog done fell off? I got up and opened the door. And what it was is that old hog was cooking. His leg straightened out. When that leg straightened out, when it go up, it's coming up, it caught that other that other rack. It had the shoulders on it oh. and tilted it over and the shoulder done fell down on top of the cooker down there. Well, you know, it went in the flames because, you know, it's got a big shield over that smoker down in there for the wood to fire it. And I laid the shoulder. Oh, Lord, I got to go there. And I said, what caused that, I wonder? And I had to put that shoulder back on, and I watched it come around, and I watched that leg catch that thing, and I said, oh, Lord. Well, before I could get the foot off the foot pedal, it done tilted that under, kick that thing back down in the smoker again. Mm. So now I got to go back there and dig it out again. Here I am, I'm getting all messed up, all my smoke coming out of there. I got the doors open so my flames are getting hotter, you know. I'm supposed to keep it 225. So then I look in there. Well, I ain't got no boning saw. I ain't got I ain't got no hacksaw. And I got to looking, and there's a sheetrock saw laying down in the bucket. Oh. I said, well, where'd I get that at? <laughs> so and it was brand new, still had sticker on. We hadn't used it. I bought that thing used somewhere, and I don't know how it got in that bucket. So I run out there. I get that thing and I'm over there and I saw his leg off. I said, well, that'll help. I got the other one over and I saw it off too. So I saw all four legs off, shorter on the two halves, you know, and then, so they would fit in the rack. I didn't care how much it straightened out. Good. And then finally I got it going. And then D Dennis and him showed up about six o'clock and I'm asleep because, you know, I've been up since about 1.30 fighting with that hog, you know. and. The fire's about to go out. <laughs> I done let it burn out trying to get that thing done with the doors open, you know, because you can't throw the fire with the doors open. Because you got that big old double door up over you open up, you know. And uh, finally we got it kicked back in there. And uh, 
next morning, next morning they come in there, and uh, so I took that hog and had a, I had a big old tray made up, you know, a wooden tray. And we, we bought a bunch of bananas and grapes and peppers and, <laughs> and leaf lettuce. And we had that hog stand up. We put the two hats, stuck them together, stood him up, you know, make him look like he was just one, you know. Had him standing up there and had that thing all decorated up real pretty. And I said, now, boys, I said, right, there you go. Well, let's see what happens there. So they, the judges came in, you know. Well, they, they kind of, I like to have a piece off the rib and the tenderloin. I'm looking over at Dennis and said, hmm. Where that at? <laughs> well, hey, I meant to go to butcher school for I come in here and done this. I didn't, I didn't know where to dig at, you know. I seen a tender long before at the store, but there wasn't no hog tag to it, you know. How am I gonna do now? So I'm over there, you know, and and uh, and and you can pull the skin up because it done crisped up, you know. And I that reason then I I just started knocking off some real meat, you know, put it in the plate. I reached over and got some off the shoulder, you know, and I got some off the ham back in, you know. And I done something, and I said, I hope that's a tenderloin up there. I put, I put it in a plate, and I was handing it around them judges, you know. But the good thing was, them judges in out the cold. So they sitting in there with us, and, uh, and you know, I had some warm cider over, some hot cider over there. Of course, I had all three of my barbecue sauces, you know, my ketchup base, tomato base, or what you want to call it, and my vinegar base, and my mustard base. If you're down in the lower part of the state, you don't know what they're going to want down there. You know, that's all mixed up down there. So... And uh, so I give them some of that, you know, and I picked off it. And, and they was asking me about how we cooked it, you know, and you had to sit there and shoot a line of breeze with them, you know. I mean, I'm shooting the bull with them because I ain't know nothing about no whole hog, you know, other than just rub that thing, shoot him up, throw him on the cooker, and when he's done, just eat him, you know. That's all I know. I know what to tell them. So, okay, Dennis. Dennis said, well, we're doing pretty good. So we got that hog, and we throwed it back on the smoker, you know. And uh, cause it done cool down by then, you know, this is about 10, 11 o'clock the next morning. And we throw them on there and then the next thing you know, it's ribs. And we had the ribs inside the cambro and, and, the, and the shoulders in there. And um, so it's time for them to do the ribs. And uh, and my favorite to do is baby bats, you know. I, I hadn't been, back then I wasn't cooking St. Louis hardly at all. Didn't even know what St. Louis rib looked like. You know, I, didn't, I know baby bats. That's why I like baby bats. So, when they come back, well, I took one of them aluminum trays out and I put my cutting board up on there and I had my rib laying up there and I done the same thing I did that big hog. I put some leaf lettuce and some, you know, I garnished that thing up with grapes and all different colors and banana and all the way around that real, real pretty, you know. So here they come. Well, I done practiced on the big hog, so now, the, now I'm getting braver, right? So here they come. Let me, let me, let me shoot them a line right here and they come in, you know. So, well, of course, Start talking about, you know, preparation. I told him, you know, about cutting, you know, and getting the little bone out of it in between the in between the knuckles, you know, and all that. And then and then uh, take the take the we took the membrane off and then I rubbed it with some of my rub, which I used my homemade rub. And uh, we'd won a bunch of rib contests and chicken in the past, you know, with my rub. So I had that thing all rubbed up and uh, they would rub them up. Well, we marinated them first after we got them cleaned up. And then we marinated them, then we took them out, and then we rubbed them. And then them set overnight, and then we put them on the cooker this morning at 6 o'clock, you know. I just going through the spiel, you know, and how good, it, how good it was. And then right at the end, I brushed some of this sauce on. Well, now, I done done away with them three sauces because the sauce I'm using on my ribs is a little bit different. So I'm using that, that uh, blue uh, blackberry wine apple cinnamon sauce we mixed up. And... Uh, that goes on my ribs because it's real good with the sweet flavor. And uh, I told him about the sauce, you know, we make it, and here it is right here, you know. And, uh, oh, they was in there for a long time, and I kept cutting ribs. You know, matter of fact, I had to get, I had a rack up there. Then they, there were three or four judges in there, and then they'd eat that whole rack. I had to get another rack up. <laughs> I said, well, this looks pretty good. So we chopped them up, you know. They sitting there eating ribs, putting that sauce on there, and, and uh, one judge wanted to try some of that, that tomato based sauce on it. And uh, I told him, I said, Yeah, go ahead and try some of that. And he tried some of that on there and he said, oh, No, no, no. This ain't the right sauce for these ribs. You said, You got the best sauce for the rib right there, that, bl that blueberry, blackberry wine sauce. He said, That's that's the best. This right here, they don't make it match. And I said, No, I said, That's the thing about barbecue and you got to match your rub and your sauce, you know. All that's got to match, you know. Even even if you even if you're injecting that thing or marinating it, you know. Uh, 
Brian, you got everything's got to match, or you're gonna have a weird taste. You know, I figured that out a long time ago. So, so then they left, and then then we done the same thing with the shoulder. We got we got that big old tray out there, and got that cutting board up there, and layer, layer that stuff. Well, all we done was tuck that cutting board and everything, lay that in there. You know, had to move stuff around a little bit because that shoulder was so big. You know, and uh, and we injected that that uh, that shoulder just like we did the. The hog, you know, and rubbed it up and everything, and uh, and then uh, here they come. So I just went through kind of the same spill, but I put my uh, three sauces back out there, and I moved the blackberry wine over on out of the way, and then here they come in the tray. But see, they in out the cold, out the weather, and in there, you know, and I got them in there, and I got hot cider, ice water, anything they wanted in the fridge, you know, they was. There was some cold duck beverages in there if they wanted them, you know. I didn't care what they were. If they wanted anything, they could have it, you know. Just, you know, come on in here and have fun, you know. And uh, and we talked about the, the rub and talked about the the, the sauces and, and, you know, and about preparing it. And, uh, you know, I told them, of course, the butt end up on the top was the part of the better part of it. But, the, you know, the shank was a good part, too, you know. It was all, it was all good meat, sweet meat on that shoulder. But the, the shoulder you got to cook slow. You can't cook it fast. It ain't like a ham, you know. And you know, and most people don't even know where a butt is on the hog. They think it's a, the rear end, but that's the ham back there. You know, the shoulders into the, the, the butt's into the shoulders. So, so you know, and and he asked me if I knew where she butt was on on the hog. <laughs> I done got smart enough by then. I know where it was at. <laughs> I, the only part I didn't know is where the butt was. And the ham was, I sure didn't know what a tender law and all that other stuff was in there. You know, I'd tell them I could make some souse meat and whatever food and all that. Throw all the leftovers in a pot and cook it instead. That's where you got that from, you know. But, but yeah, I knew where that part was at, so we found a good one. But the next, the, right before we went down to awards, there was a guy walking around from a newspaper. And he was taking pictures. And he wouldn't let us walk up to the wharves before me and Dennis Nettler we got beside the trailer and he took a picture of us, you know. And uh, I didn't think nothing about it at the time, but he didn't take but a couple of people's pictures and then he, he was gone, you know. And of course, there was a hundred cooking teams there. I mean, they come from all over the country. They were definitely some big boys there, you know. So me and Dennis go up there, you know. And, and, and I'm not even paying no attention because I'm sitting down here, you know, this ain't no big deal, you know. I mean, you know. What in the world could we have done in a contest with a hundred people, you know? I won with 30 and 50 and maybe 60 teams, but, you know, I'd won first place in chicken or, or rib or butt, you know, and brisket was hard far and few between for me cooking in that, you know, so. But here, here they come and started giving out. They called, they called the uh, top 10 for, for whole hog. Well, of course, you know, we wasn't in no whole hog contest, that's for sure. We were way out on that because we didn't know nothing about it. I mean, I probably got a bad score just on presentation, you know, by sitting there talking to them, you know, when they come back to the trailer. That's where I lost it at right there. So, I mean, meat was good. I ain't gonna lie about it. But we wasn't in the top 10. Come find out we finished about, I think, 27th. But, you know, it wasn't bad for 100 puking teams out there. And then, then they come up there and they started calling out 10th place in the, in the, in the shoulders. And uh, I'm sitting over and then I got the third place, so you know, I figured, well, <laughs> you know, I'm over there shooting the breeze, everybody. And all of a sudden, somebody kicked, hey, he called your name out. I said, what for? He said, first place. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, come on. <laughs> I mean, me and Dennis and David, none of us paying no attention, you know, the time they got the third, fourth place, we done moved on to something else, you know, shooting the breeze. So we run up there and get a first place trophy in the check, you know, and it's all right, you know, we come back and we sit over talking about it. And I missed them for calling me out first place in the ribs. They called me out first place in the ribs. They said, Dennis, Dennis, they got the first place in the ribs. Come on, come on. We went, we went back up there and got first place. We started to walk off the stage, and the guy, you know, he, he said, whoa, 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 come here, come here. He says, uh, don't go nowhere. Said, Wait a minute. I'm having a hard time getting you up here. He said, uh, state championship and the grand champion, uh, Kick back cold, racing ball. Oh, oh, oh. Another check, another trophy. Here I stand there, Dennis got a trophy, uh, David got a trophy, and I got a state championship trophy, which is right over there. I got it in my hand, in all them checks. And I said, I'm smiling. Yeah, 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 baby. This fun. This fun. <laughs> <laughs> like this. 
That's funny. You had him in the you had him in the truck, and they said, "Give me some tender loin." You're like, "What the hell is that?" Yeah, where's that at? I'm sitting there thinking, "Where's that at? What, what part of the hole did I get that from? I know it's inside somewhere." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I dressed out deer and everything, but I, I dressed them out and take them over and let some butcher cut them up, you know. I didn't, where, where did they cut that tunnel on from? You know, I, well, you know, you got to go to school to learn all that. I, I ain't been to school. <laughs> well, now, you've had uh, quite a bit of KCBS experience, too. Uh, tell us about some of the contests you did in KCBS. Yeah, now, we, for the first, golly, I guess uh, five years, I did. That's all I did KCBS. I didn't know South Carolina Barbecue Association existed. And uh, we've been uh, we've been as far as Vegas, up New York, down towards the Keys, and a lot of places in between. We did we did it. Now I mean, one year, one year I probably did a contest at least three a month. Oh wow! And we started out in Lakeland, Florida. I started out down now. And I just traveled, and me and Kevin went out to Vegas, and uh, we won first place out there in the dessert contest. We done a grilled banana split and a martini glass. That was pretty cool. Oh wow! Yeah, and uh, we thought that was good, and uh, we finished second in a, a Iron Chef contest out there they had on Friday, and uh, and I don't know, we was in the top ten in the in the barbecue contest, but the, what? What we was doing out there was a KCVS sweet sauce, and out there they wanted KCVS hot sauce. Hot sauce. Yeah, and you yeah, get on the other side. As a matter of fact, I think we could have won the, uh, we done a pork tenderloin for the anything but on Friday night. And uh, if we'd done a beef tenderloin, we might have won. Because when you get across that Mississippi and get up through there, they don't know them old cowboys out there like beef. They don't know nothing about no pig, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we uh, we done pretty good out there. and. Uh, we we've won all over the country. We I've, I've done a lot. In my first year, first contest we went to, we was out there on the streets of Lexington, North Carolina, and uh, man, I didn't have all these pellet cooking stuff. I had three of them Weber bullets out there, and man, I mean, this is my first contest, you know, and I'm sitting there, you know, and we we shooting up this butt with all kind of stuff. It even had Jack Daniels in it. Man, we just shooting up everything we could get, and then and then you know. We got the ribs over here, you know, and our brisket, you know, and we done injected it with something. And uh, I think the same thing we injected, the, pretty sure it was the same thing we injected the butt with. And uh, we rubbed, all of them had different rubs, and, uh, and, uh, and I didn't have, I didn't, back in that first contest, I didn't have no sauce and no rub or nothing of my own. I was buying stuff off the shelf, you know. And, uh, but I wouldn't buy stuff you'd buy at Sam's or, or, or buy low angles nowhere. I was getting stuff you'd get. Uh, competition you know, team. Made. Yeah, competition team had made over the years or something. You know, I used some of that. And uh, and Kevin, my buddy that I've seen at the firegrounds, he's he's one that got me into it and showed me what to do, you know, how to make the trays, presentation. Because, you know, KCBS ain't no, play, ain't no playground when it comes to presentation, you know. I mean, leaf, lettuce, and parsley. And I mean, it's, it's tray got to be perfectly clean. Of course, they do in, in the other contest too. But you know, that leaf lettuce and everything. It, you know, that that that, that turned out big. Then the leaf lettuce was the big thing, you know. And the years later, it become parsley thing, you know, parsley box, you know, not a leaf lettuce box. And I and I used to sit down there, and in just a few minutes, I'd have a beautiful leaf lettuce box. I put my boxes together on Saturday morning while everything was cooking. I'd put them together. It wouldn't take but a few minutes. I'd get them. That leaf lettuce out and drop it in some some 110 degree, 130 degree water. You know, you know, we're still on the stalk. Let it sit there, cut the end of the stalk. All that sit there, that it suck up some of that warm water. Then I put it in the cold water and wa had it washed. And then I take it, start cutting it up, and then I'd flake it apart. And then I'd take them pretty leaf and I started going around that box. I put me two layers in there and had it fixed and I had it laying off the side a little bit. And I put two picks in there and push it in when I closed the box. I opened that box up, it opened up just like a flower. Wow. Oh, it was beautiful. But, you know, later on in the years, that didn't work no more. So, uh, we up there in Lincoln, and, and uh, I got this butt on the cooker. And, uh, man, that butt was black as that Zuma motorcycle over there. 
it just crushed it. And I didn't know, I didn't, am I, I ain't, this is my first time, you know, right? I mean, I, I cooked a couple bucks at the house that didn't look like that, you know. And I didn't know what caused it to be like that. Of course, I injected this and what I done at the house, I didn't inject, you know. And I'm sitting there looking at that thing. And this lady come over and looked down inside there and I had the lid up. I was just sitting there looking at it, you know, and I took a probe in it and I was waiting on to see what temperature it was. She says, my God, son, what is that? I said, that's my black butt. <laughs> And I put the lid back on out there, Lord have mercy, that thing is black. What am I going to do with that? You know, but you know what? That was some sweet, juicy meat. I turned that thing in, and it finished second place. Oh. First contest. And I didn't realize some people I was cooking around, you know, they were big dogs. You know, there were some big dogs there in the first contest I went to. You know? And, uh, but after that, I didn't win nothing. I didn't do anything. And I went to contest at the contest, you know, the rest of the year, because that was, I think that was in June, when Lincoln in North Carolina, that's the early part of the year, right? Mm -hmm. May or June. And then after that, I didn't do no good. I went to a few, went to Tron, and all, and then I went to, went to, I went to a bunch of them, and uh, I didn't do no good. My wife looked at me and told me, she said, well, uh, you need to start winning or find some other hobby. Cost too much money. And, and man, you, you, I mean, you know, it five six hundred dollars a weekend, you know, back then and gas and fuel it was, you know, and buying all your meat and everything, and and then doing anything but. I was winning with anything but though, because I started doing that coconut shrimp, and I mean I won twenty and some contests back to back that I did with the coconut shrimp, so that was hot item. And uh, but man, I, next year I told Kevin, I said, Kevin, I said you want to try? I said, let's go cook together and try. I said I want, I need to learn a little bit. I said I. I said, you showed me the rope, but I said, you ain't showed me what I need to know. I said, I, I'm missing something, you know, a little trick, you know, a little something here, you know. And and them guys around the barbecue uh, teams, you know, they, they wouldn't tell you nothing. They'd smile at you, you know. And they'd be sitting over there shaking red pepper in that thing. They'd have, they'd have something else in there, and they'd say, that's red pepper, you know. I ain't no red and pepper. And it was, oh, they had to, oh. They'd they... in there or something, you know. They'd be trying to fool you, you know. But you know, hey, yeah, that trick, you know. <laughs> so, I didn't know that went on. That's cool. Oh man! And then we, uh, so we, uh, I went, I went with Kevin up yonder, and uh, and I looked like a little schoolboy. I had my notepad out, you know. And and Kevin said one of the biggest thing is every time you go cook, you need to take notes. What time you put stuff on? What time you check the temperature? You change the temperature? You know. Like I start off at 225 and later in the night I go 250 and then right before I put the chicken on I go 275, you know. And he said the main thing is take notes of what you do, what ingredients you use, you know, where you bought your meat at, you know. He said that's got a lot to do with it, what kind of meat was it, you know. Because you can go to Sam's one week and you buy Smithfield, next weekend you buy something, you don't even know what that is. It's got a name on it I ain't never seen it before. And I went up there last week and bought something and it didn't have a name on the package, you know. I bought it because it was uh, it was about sixty cent cheaper than what the other ones they had. Or they had them labeled wrong or something. I said, well, let me add them, you know. Uh, and, and it was good. I finished fourth place with them. But you know, but you never know what kind of meat you buying. And and some of that meat. I mean, you sat there and you done bought two butts, and you got one butt that's reading one hundred and forty, and this one's reading one hundred and sixty, you know. And this one keeps climbing, and this one over here don't climb. And it, when it does get warmer, it's still tough because when you stick that probe in there. Uh, the secret, the good thing, when you stick that probe inside your meat, you want to feel like it's sticking in some warm butter. You know, you want to flow in there, not be, you know, you can't push it in there, and it can't fall in there, you know. That's kind of, I mean, sometimes I take meat off because of the way it feels, but not what the temperature is. Because it ain't the same. So, being consistent and, and taking notes is a big thing. So that weekend I was up there with Kevin, I wrote down everything he did. You know, what temperature, what this, what what do you use this rope for? What do you use that rope for? And then and then and then I come home and then on my ribs I come up with this rib rub. And I started using it. Well, man, every time I go somewhere I win. And over the ribs and pretty good and chicken. I done two different things with I put two rubs and put together for the chicken. And I was winning everywhere I went with the chicken. I mean, boy, the chicken was hot. I was hot with chicken. Matter of fact, I had a couple people come and ask me if I, they went to Jack Daniels, would I go with them and just do the chicken? Well, Lord, yeah, I'd have went up there, you know. I'd done the chicken for them. As long as they give me the first prize money, I'd win. You know, we're going to be a big deal. But, yeah, and, uh, and, 
and we did that, you know, for like two or three years. I mean, everywhere I went, I was hot. I mean, I could get Jack so south back in the early days, you know, and, and Johnny Trigg and, and uh, of course, Leon didn't, uh, Leanne didn't come along until not long ago, and then uh, Tommy Stone, you know, and and all them people, I cooked against them, you know, and it seemed like I walked more than they walked, you know. I, I don't want to smile. I said, there was a big boy over here. About time to look out for that old Johnny over here, he got a pistol in his boot, you know, he shoot you. He don't like it, you know. And uh, we at the Jack Daniels, I'm not Jack Daniels, but at the uh, Grand Ole Opry, first one they had, you know. I walked more than all of them walked, you know. I mean, I, I walked a bunch, you know, in the top ten in, in all four categories, you know. But I didn't win grand champion or reserve. I wanted to win grand champion. I had a gold fiddle looking at that trophy thing. That was pretty cool. But, you know. And then, uh, and then down to Sedita, Georgia, I finished uh, I finished reserve grand champion against Jacksonville South. And he beat me but a tenth of a point. That's how close it was, you know. And, uh, and, uh, I mean, everywhere I went, I was winning down in Greenwood, you know. I won the Governor's Award in South Carolina four or five times, you know, for the best in the state. Won the North Carolina Championship, Georgia, Tennessee. I mean, wow. we've been a lot of places and yeah. done a lot of good cooking, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's fun. And, it, and what I like about them, them pellet smokers is you just roll it in the trailer and you put your race car in there, you know, and you tie it all down and you get everything rolled up and you go down to the racetrack and you're down there and you pull that pellet smoker out and set it up underneath the tent. And, well, boys, we're going, what are we going to eat tonight? We're going to eat some butts. Okay, about 6 o'clock in the morning and put some butts on, get ready to go out and play and race all day long. And, and you know, probably about... Two o'clock, open that cooker up. First time I'll open it up and probe them. They look good. Wrap them. They about 160. Let me wrap them and spray them down. You know, wrap them, put them back on the smoke and close the door. Then go out and play the rest of the evening. You know, then that night about six o'clock, pull them off, pull some meat, got baked beans you put in there four hours early. You know, they be like, oh, come on, boy, let's eat. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, ain't done nothing. You know, like I'm some big chef over there, and they're back on. Man, how you cook that? I just throw it in the cooker and went racing. That's what you do. <laughs> Don't sit over here and play with this meat. Uh -huh. Ribs, we cook ribs down there at the racetrack. And I mean, you know, I mean, you down there racing, you got Paul Newman down there. And some, one time Tom Cruise was down there, you know. And uh, and, uh, and you got uh, uh, Brian Johnson, the lead singer for ACDC. Now, me, him, and his wife got real close over the years. So real close. They race in the same class with MG Midget. We've had a lot of fun together. He's eaten a lot of my barbecue. And uh, of course, we make a lot of homemade wine too. And I give him some wine. And he's called me from, he called me all the way from Florida to come back from, a, from a tour they was on with ACDC. And, and uh, he called me, and, and he flat out told me I missed my calling. That I ought not be driving race cars and cooking. I ought to be making wine. He, he, he uh, I gave him a bottle of wine when he was at Road Atlanta racing, and uh, he went home and put it in the wine cabinet. He's got a wine room, you know, where he keeps a lot of wine. He likes a lot of wines, you know, different kind of wine. And him and his wife put that in there and then they went off to Vancouver. That's when they uh, a few years back they done the new album and then they then they done the uh the uh video for the album, you know, and he was doing the video and uh, cause he called me from Vancouver uh when he done the album and asked me if I was gonna be at Road Atlanta. I told him, Yeah, I was gonna be down there and he told me he was gonna get to come. So they was gonna take a break during the during the road line and come to the MIDI because MIDI is the biggest race of the year for the historic stock car and the historic race, uh, sports car racing association. So that's the biggest race of the year. Everybody down there. And uh, so he came down and I gave him that wine tuck home. But then when they came back from Vancouver after doing their uh, doing their video shoot and uh, he had some friends over to the house down in, he lived down in Saratosa, Florida. And uh, I was sitting on the deck of the restaurant. We had the restaurant open back in 08. And uh, I was sitting out on the deck talking to somebody and the phone rang and, hey mate, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm sitting out here, shooting the breeze, and eating the sandwich. He says, well, look here. I said, me and Brenda come back from uh, Vancouver. We had some friends over. And I went in the wine cellar and I asked Brenda, I said, Brenda, where we get this wine at? It ain't got no label on it. She said, oh, that's some of that stuff Red gives you. And what it was was some blueberry wine I, me and the wife had made. And I gave it to him. And uh, so 
He took it out there and opened it up, and they started passing around and pouring a little bit in the clay. And oh, he says, man, everybody just flipped out over. That's the best wine they ever drank in their life. And my wines are real fruity taste, you know. They're not alcohol taste, they're fruity taste, you know. I mean, that way you can sit there and, and, and sip it and don't, you know, you don't have that alcohol taste. I don't like it, alcohol, strong alcohol taste. When some wines is too overpowering, you know. And uh, but he told me, he said, you missed your call. I said, you ought to be a winemaker. Of course, Benny Parsons, I used to give him and Richard, Ch send some to Richard Tillman. I used to give him some of my wine to be at Ryan's house. And uh, in that same blueberry wine that I give Brian, I'd give uh, Benny Parsons. He come to me one day up there, and uh, we was at the uh, we was at Ryan Newman's house, and he he come in the trailer, and uh, I told him I said, well, I hear you and Rich Chillers making wine now. He said, yeah. And Buddy Baker was in there with him, and uh, they come in there and get him a sample of the ribs. We was cutting up ribs, so I give him I give him some scuffadine wine I had made. I gave him a little bit of the glass. Man. God dang, that's some good stuff right there. He said, that's real good. Well, later on that evening, that we got through serving, and we, we was loading up, and we was cleaning up or put, packing up stuff. He come over and told me, he said, you know, Red, said, my, uh, my mama, she said, she's, she's in her 90, but the doctor said she was in great health, but she just, she just didn't have appetite to eat. And he said, that's bad for her. And he said, you ought to get her to drink a little beer or drink a little wine, you know, because, you know, alcohol, you know, it helps your appetite a little bit. And uh, Benny said he'd go over and take some, some of his wine, some of Richard's wine they make over to me. Man, I don't want none of that rock gut stuff. Don't bring me none of that stuff. But I told him, I said, well, look here, Benny. I said, take, you, take a couple bottles of this right here. I give him some blueberry I had down there. And I give him some scuff down. I give him a couple bottles of different kind of wine to take home with him. And Benny, he goes to a, he goes to his mama's house, and uh, the weekend after that, the weekend that's when Katrina and Wilma went through down in Florida, and went, Wilma went through Florida. So I went down, and the weekend after that, I took off and went to Wilma down in uh, Miami, and I hauled generators and stuff around with the rollback, and uh, down there doing that period of time. And uh, well, that that weekend after I gave that wine to Benny, he went to his mama's house, and he went in there, and well, he called me. And he left me a message to call him back. My blueberry wine was a hit out down in Florida. So I called him. And this is what he told me. He said, he said, went over to Mama's house. He said, my uncle was over there. And my wife and Patty, his sister, was over there. And all of them. He said, he said, now, Red. He said, I went over to Mama. And I said, Mama, I said, I got you some wine. She said, boy, I told you not to bring me no more of that rock gut stuff over here y'all make. I don't want none of that. He said, no, now, Mama, this here comes from old hillbilly from Black Mountain, North Carolina. Lived down in South Carolina. See, and he makes some good wine. I have to admit, Mama, he's a good wine maker. Makes some good stuff. He's, then he said he poured her some in the glass and handed it to her. And said she took a sip of that. I said, my gosh, she took another sip of that. And she reached over and grabbed the bottle and said, get you on. <laughs> <laughs> so she <laughs> ate it back. <laughs> Yeah, I bet you want to know that you won't come work for me. I said, I make mine in six gallon containers. I don't make mine in no two, three hundred gallons at a time. I don't believe y'all y'all want to make it the way I make it. No, I can't do that. I don't I wouldn't know how to do it. You know, I know how to do it in, in small containers and make it, but I I'll tell you what, I could have made a big commercial. Yeah. No, uh uh. Yeah. It was some good stuff though. But <laughs> he but he won't know if he gets some more, so I I gave him some more, you know, case of it, that blueberry. That, that blueberry wine, though, you, I was making it when the blueberries came in, so, you know, when it's gone, it's gone, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave him all I had, so it was all gone. But that's it, that's it for his mama, you know. Benny was a nice guy. I really liked old Benny. And, uh, boy, I hate to see him go, because, uh, matter of fact, that uh, I seen him the weekend before uh, before he passed away. That was at Rock, when I went to Rockingham, he was at, uh, he was at Ryan's house, and uh, oh man, I I upset him something awful, you know. He come in the trailer, and he he'd been out of work, you know. He quit announcing for a while because you know he had cancer, and then and then he come in the he come in the trailer, and he had a brace on his arm, and uh, I looked at him, I said, Benny, how you been doing? I said, I've been doing good. He said, I said, what's that brace on your hand? You break your hand or something? He said, no. Uh, I must done something. Had a knot come up on my wrist. The doctor told me not to use it for a while. It'd go away. He said, "I'm going back to work next week." And I, I said, "Well, that's a that's a good thing, you know. He's going back to work." And uh, 
he's a real nice guy. Him and his wife both, I love them both, you know, they're sweet. And uh, he uh, he come over there and he had this big old tote bag. And he had wine in there and he had some Riesling that he'd made, you know. And he 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 said he sent me he sent me about four bottles, I think it was, up on the counter. Look at that, Red. I bought some of my wine right there. I said, we make, that's some new wrestling we make. And uh, that's pretty good stuff right there. Yeah, I said, well, that's pretty good. Yeah, I said, here, wait a minute. I got something for you. I reached down in the bottle. I got a bottle of blueberry wine out. One bottle I hand to him. I said, go, Ben, I got you something right there. I kept cutting up ribs of meat. That's what I was cutting up, you know, I kept cutting up. He put that bottle in his tote bag. And, well, at first he sat there and he was looking at that one bottle. He looked back over at them four bottles he put up there. Kept looking back, kept looking over there. Finally, he put that, that ball in his bag and started to walk out. Door, and he looked back and said, and you, do, you do don't realize, Red, I give you four bottles of my wine. I said, yeah, Benny, but your mama said that's rock gut stuff, and what I give you is the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all see the sad look on his face. <laughs> you know what I had him in, so he didn't know what to do. Yeah. I said, no, Benny, I got you a bunch down there. You come back and get all you want. I said, I want to fill your bag up. <laughs> he, he, he was a man. Oh, man. Yeah. But boy, he, did. he was a nice guy. Right? You don't lie about it. He was just as good as gold. Yeah, but, you know, I met a lot of people in the, in the days out there. And, uh, Michael Walter, you know. Michael sent me that race suit over there, the kickback coat, I mean the, the Napa race suit to go with the MG Midget. And uh, of course I'm I'm a Napa. I, I can do a Michael Walker uh, stand in, you know, Napa stand in, you know. But uh, I'd mess him up though, because I'm way better looking than he is. You know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, when we race that car, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff for Napa, you know, and I figured uh, them boys, they didn't want me to put no stickers on that car. I don't race car with no stickers on. What is that, you know? What's sports car stuff? I, yeah, but this is America, you know what I mean? This ain't British, Britain or nowhere, you know? So I put me in Napa for dick, and them boys at Napa take care of me. They give me some things every night and help me with a little bit of racing, you know? Give me a lot of business for my catering, and, and then I got, uh, you know, I do a lot, cook a lot for Michael Walker, especially when he was a DEI. Oh, I used to go up a lot when he worked for DEI, and he'd autograph things and them, and uh, him and, uh, Ron Capps, the funny car driver. You know, they did them little commercials together. They should have put me in there with him. It would have been funny. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking that tea, you know. Oh, Lord have mercy. Them guys are crazy, but, you know, we've done a lot of cooking for them, you know. And, uh, oh, Tony Stewart and Ryan Newman, you know. But, yeah, I, I really enjoyed cooking for them guys. They were a bunch of good guys, you know. Michael and Ryan and Tony, you know. And, uh, but yeah, we need we need to get back up there and do some more cooking for them here. Hopefully this year we get to go cook for them again. We done steaks for them, barbecue, you know, a lot of different things, you know. But yeah, that uh, he sent me that red suit to go with that car. Fit me good too. It's a little bit long. He sent me sorry shoes. I wore twelves. He was fourteen, but that's all right. That way I ain't got to worry about hitting my toe against the dash when I'm patting that gas and you know, up against that floorboard somewhere. I got a little cushion up there like steel toe, I think. <laughs> with them big shoes. And then uh, and then we got the, the race suit for the kickback coal. That's the, I call it, when I put that on, I'm the pig in the suit, you know. That's what I tell everybody. I'm the pig in the race suit to go with the, the uh, car over there. And of course, we got a, a, we got a two-piece uh, Earnhardt suit in there, too. Uh, Good wrench, two piece like this right here. This is a guy gave this to me. He used to be a crew chief for. I think this was when he was uh, working for. Uh, I think uh, Mark Martin when he drove the army car, and now he went to Ryan. He's a, he's a big boy like me, but this is a this is a crew suit. You know that just wear around the shop or when they doing something you know other than working on race car. No no fire suits. So, but I got the rest of everything. I got some fire suits. So. Well, that there says Nextel. It was Nextel, then it's Sprint. What is it now? Still Sprint, ain't it? Is it Sprint? Okay, I don't know. Ain't it? I don't know. I don't know. They changed the name. Every time yeah, they got Winston's left, you know. Man, well, Winston had it stay Winston for years, didn't it? Oh, yeah, until government got hot with cigarette smokers and all that, you know, and everything. 
and yeah. they had to pay all them fines and everything. That's a lot of money, I guess, to sponsor all that in a NASCAR, you know, so. Yeah. But you know, the richest guy in the world owns a telecommunications company, you know, yeah. out of Mexico, so he's richer than Jimmy Buffett and, uh, and Gates, so. And I guess they got the same money to sponsor one, neck tail, and of course Sprint bought them out, you know. And then the nationwide, that was Bush. Bush for years, you know. I mean, still making Bush beer now. I guess the government got into that deal, but, you know, they changed the name to Nationwide. Oh, it's Shorten. Nationwide Bush Series now. Yeah, the Nationwide. Oh, shoot. Nationwide is Bush. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, some foreigners bought Budweiser, so. They might have decided they want to do it. Where are they from? Uh, let me get it right now. Brazil bought Miller and Coors, and some other people bought Budweiser and paid sixty-four billion dollars for it. Well, that's the largest beer company in the world. I mean, Michelob, Bush. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I forget. Now it was on. It was on uh, History Channel, but I forget who the company, what, what country they were from. But Brazil bought Miller's, Coors, all the other beer companies. But see, all the other beer companies combined equal Budweiser. Budweiser is big. Yeah. So all the other beer companies combined, and then the other company just bought Budweiser, and they're both equal size, but. They got 50 companies to match one. <laughs> oh, I went down. I went oh, down. I mean, that's a big company. Yeah. You know. I mean, you know, but you know, it's getting where NASCAR's having a hard time with sponsorships. You know, they, uh, a lot of people's gone that used to be there years ago. You know, and of course, the economy's changed that. Different things. You know, I mean, they, a lot of guys out there. I mean, look at Kirk Bush right over here. Did you see the weekend race? And you know. Right here in Spartanburg, Kirk Bush team, Phoenix Racing, uh, he, he had his car fixed up like uh, like Will Fire did in the, in, the, in the Talladega Nights, you know, got a picture of the animal up on the hood, everybody there was, and the me on there, M-E. Oh. And, yeah, his car, that's what he raced this weekend. And done good until he got tangled up in a little wreck or something, but, you know, he was up in the front, and uh, he might have even led that race one time and do it, I think he did, but, you know, it just goes to show you, you know, that uh, really, you know, I mean, and, and you know, I had a guy approach me one time about building a Bush team and, uh, and asked me if I thought I could put together a winning Bush team. And uh, I think Volvo, Volvo uh, Equipment Company, you know, with grading and all that is one who's wanting to do the sponsoring. And I went and talked to a few people. And matter of fact, uh, uh, that's back when Jeremy was, Clements was still driving the Archer. And I went and, and uh, Asked his daddy and, and Jim, Jeremy if they'd like to, you know, be part of that. And uh, and uh, Steve Allen up in uh, up in uh, Murphy, North Carolina, used to be the engine builder with uh, with uh, Kel Yarborough and some of the other teams. Now he's up in the mountains. He got away from NASCAR, but he, he still built motor forms and everything, and uh, builds a lot of race car engines. Got a big old place up in Murphy, North Carolina. He's one that built the engines that's in the over sitting over here for the my Winston Cup car motors. It's just, they're awful powerful to be under horsepower compared to the rest of the guys. Real powerful, and uh, he's a good engine builder. I had to talk to him about uh, being my engine man, you know, and uh, and I had some good advice about you know when you set up when you set up to run a season, you know, you got to have two Talladega, two super speedway cars, you know, Talladega and uh, and then down at. Uh, uh, Daytona. Then you got to have a, a road course car. You know they race road course now. But you got to have a, you got to have one or two road course cars. And then you got to have a bunch of short track and medium track cars. You know, so I mean they ain't cheap to build these things. You know, and you got and motors. You know, man, a brand new motor. I can't believe sixty, eighty thousand dollars. I think they say you can start from scratch. You know, build wow. brand new. All the machines, especially in the SP2 engine with all the head work and everything. You know, and uh, buying this in by the intakes, ain't nothing but cast, and then you gotta do them, you know, they gotta do their own stuff, you know. And, uh, and uh, matter of fact, Steve probably told me what he paid for that four axis uh, machine to, to do the heads and stuff with. You gotta have a four axis machine to do them now, you know. And, uh, 
if I went back and told Bobo, I mean, if they want to be a winning team, and uh, I was going to put Jeremy driving. He's a great driver. I, I know he's a great driver. He might not be doing all that good in Bush, but, I mean, well, the, the nationwide races, but, I mean, he would be if if he you had the sponsor right. and the money, you know. Yeah. It's, it's about the money. I, I mean, you go out there and look and see who's winning, you know, it ain't the guys that ain't got the money. It's the teams with the money, you know. Yeah. But they got multiple teams, so they have a better chance, you know. But uh, that's where it's at. And I told them it'd take $12 million to put the winning crew chief, winning driver, winning team together, and winning cars. You know? I mean, don't go out there and buy a bunch of you stuff, start from scratch, build new. You know? Mm -hmm. now, let me get me a crew chief in here and, 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 and somebody know, and let's start setting up his race car. And, and, and of course, I know I can do that, you know? I mean, I. I do that on a low budget against these big boys that I race against in this historic stock car racing, you know, and the Giga guys, you know. I mean, I got just just what they got, but I got little friends here to show me this and show me that, and they come down here and set my cars up, you know. And if I put a team like that together, $12 million run a whole year, you know, in it. And know they want to do it for about eight million, or I might have told them 10 million, they want to do eight million. I said, well, we, won't run, we, won't, we can't run every race on eight million, you know. You know, we, we might have strung it out to that, but you can't be a winning team. You know, you got to use used stuff, or you got to buy, you got to do something different, or you can't have the you can't have the team. You know, you need. You know, you got to slack up with somebody. You got to cut corners. You know, I mean, this is like industry. You know, you know, when it, when it takes a lot of money to go out there. Now, if you, on of course, bush race, you don't win a million dollars when you win a race like you do at Talladega, Daytona, somewhere. You know, down there. I mean, they might win a couple hundred thousand or something. You know, and. Uh, your costs will eat it up. Yeah, and, well, and, the, and your winnings, you know, it depends on how you work it out. There's different ways to pay your driver. You know, you, you tell your driver, well, you can have the winnings. That's what you're going to get paid. Or or you give them a salary, you know, and you take part of his winnings, or you give him a great big salary, and you keep all the winnings, you know. And it depends on how you want to work it, but either way you work it, you steal money, you know. Mm. And uh, they probably ain't many drivers out there just say, well, I'll just take my winnings because, ooh, winning money from far and hard between. But now the big boys, you know, I mean, he finished in second place and win a couple hundred five dollars on races, you know, in third place, you know, something like that. So it's a big difference. But I mean, if you ever sit down and look at, you just look at how much money these drivers want, even the bush time, go down and look. And then in the truck, you know, even the trucks even less, you know. I don't know how them guys in the trucks, they even survive, you know. I mean, I know they run less horsepower and they run a nine and a half run compression engines, so they, you know. So that means you don't have to quite get into the high dollar you have to, but still like a lot of money, you know, getting to the racetrack. And them tires ain't cheap, them Goodyear tires, you know, Hoosier tires, you know. Of course, the Hoosier tires are a lot cheaper than Goodyear, and they're a lot better in my book. I wish they'd do away with Goodyear. <laughs> oh. But now, well, not really. I really, what I need to do is I need to keep Goodyear and put Hoosier back in there and let them have be a competition about who can make the better tire. Because when you got one company that's locked in on the deal, and and then, you, you know, you see them having problems with tires, you know, all of a sudden everybody's having problems with tires, but they ain't got no choice but to use that tire, you know. That's oh, what they made for they that race and brought that weekend. What are you going to do, you know? Yeah. Oh, you go over to the Hoosier truck. Hey, you got, you got to set tire to the hat. Start putting tires on, bring them over next time you come in the pit and put Hoosiers on and go back out there. Oh, now we're winning the race, you know. That'd be a different story, see. Mm -hmm. you know? But. You ain't got no competition, you ain't got no choice. You know, you used to Firestone and Goodyear and, you know. They, Everybody you know, just ran the best tire they could get. Yeah. Nowadays, you know. But I guess Goodyear's got enough money to keep their pocket, you know, keep somebody's pocket filled when they can stay there, you know. Right. And that, that's probably what it goes. You know, Hoosier was there one time. Mm -hmm. And then remember back, what was it? Back when Tony was driving the 20 car, you know. He, 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 he was really bad mouthing Goodyear and, and bragging about Hoosier you know how good better tire it was. Well, I I can tell the difference but when driving that Goodyear tire then switch to Hoosier, I can tell the big difference, you know, in the way my car handles and drives and then I'm not I'm not afraid that any moment I'm gonna I'm gonna lose traction, you know. And the cycle time on them tires, you know, a little bit different. Goodyear, you know, Buddy of mine told me the best way to explain it is you go out there and you get that tire hot and you run it hard and you come in the pit and you go back out with that same tire and said it don't. It might have been sticking good when you come in the pit, but it won't be sticking good when you go back out because 
the heat cycle it's done cool down then warm back up it don't do the same it don't act the same it'll change the rubber it changes somehow or another but hoosiers i hadn't had that i hadn't seen it my father i go over i go to the racetrack with them hoosier tires i run the whole weekend but we don't run no 500 laps you know nothing like that you know we run 10 laps around two and a half mile track i 50 lap and then we'll do it again 100 lap and i mean i might have 200 laps on one set of tires i might race that whole set of tires all weekend and, it, and, and a lot of them guys go out there and practice and then come they pull in there and put a brand new sticker tire on for the for the race but no not me i'm the budget man i mean i go out there and i'm gonna i'm gonna if this thing been sticking it's gonna stick it's a hoosier tire and it goes back out you still sticks the same to me I, I can't feel the difference like i could with the good years though i mean i've even took them good years tires and fill them full of softener and got a i got a thing over next door in the other building rotism we'd rotism thing pour the softener in them and i bet you that's one sitting up underneath that tv right there i was soft and and, and then didn't use it because i quit using them but i put i, I put about a quarter softener in that thing let them rotate until it evaporated out and soften the tire up and go out to the racetrack and then it's still going to stick right you know <laughs> oh what happened to this bro? Uh -oh. hmm. and believe it or not the mg midget right there the tires for it cost more than the ones for the winston cup car them avon tires them avon tires cost more than i can buy a winston cup tire that little 13 wow. inch tire wow. oh boy that thing stick oh that thing stick do good oh you can hang it out in that right there you go around that crud, you, you feel that back end hanging out of that. You just don't worry about it, hold it to the floor. It's gone. It's sticking. Right. When the mother tires we used to run, they'd get greasy. And you couldn't hang it out like that. After it, it, it'd get really sliding and get you sideways. But since I've been using them tires, I've, I hadn't spun out. I don't think I spun out at all. The other tires I did, probably about, you know, I spun out a couple of times, hit, turned a little too hard. It seemed like to me that tires, I don't know what hard is. I imagine there is a place at the point in the time where they give, but I, I don't think I can go fast enough to make them give or turn turn hard enough. Or maybe I'm too scared to turn that hard. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you get old, you're going to turn to Well, Red, let me ask you. I know uh, you were saying that on the 20th of this month you're going to sell your shop and all. And, uh, I just want to. Next month. Yeah, next yeah. month. Okay, June 20th. Uh, uh, where are you headed to in the future? What, what's your future plans now? Well, I'm gonna, we're going to try to get rid of the, the garage here, and uh, and if we do, I'm going I'm to find another place to just put my race car, have me a little shop, you know, a place to put my trailers for cooking and stuff, you know. But uh, I'm not going to quit racing, and I'm not going to quit uh, cooking. Not right now, anyway. We're going we're gonna to continue on. I mean, uh, I turned 60 back in February, and I don't feel old, I feel young. My body tells me that sometimes I'm old, my back, you know. I've had a bad back for a few years, but, you know, but other than that, I think every, you know, we're going to keep everything intact and move over there. And I don't know, the guy comes in and buys this place might want me to stay here and rent this side of the shop out, you know. I built this just for this, you know, this right here, so I'd have me a little museum and a garage work on my race car, a place to do my cooking, you know. And a big old 12, 12 gallon uh, kettle pot over there we cook hash in and stay in here and cook it. Ain't got to go outside and start an old cast iron pot. And we got our smokers outside. And, you know, we got everything we need right here. Air conditioned in here, so if we want to come in here and shut the doors and work on a race car and sit around and shoot the breeze and have a good time, people meet, you know. You know. David Pearson lives just right across the street, so uh, he's a good friend. He's a good neighbor. And I like being here, so, you know, but we'll have to wait and see what happens when the next person buys this place. But we built this in 08 just, you know, so I'd have a new shop on that side for the junkyard and have this side just for the race cars, you know, and my catering and cooking and my toy room, you know. Built the mezzanine up there. As a matter of fact, got a queen size bed up there. Me and the wife, we uh, some nights when we do big big catering, we got to get up early the next morning around four o'clock, start warm, cooking beans and warming up the meat and getting everything ready to go catering. We'll spend the night over here. That's where we put the heat and air on this side, and we we sleep up there. And it's just like a little house, you know. 
So, you know, got a shower and over there and bathrooms and everything. Everything's good to go. But, you know, I'm I'm tired of working for a living, you know. I've done that all my life. I mean, I have really worked all my life. I mean, 100 hours a week, 90, 70 hours a week. My wife has to. Even when I worked for the automotive industry and when I was in the Army. And she, she's working down there now. She's working a lot of hours. So we're going we're gonna to kind of take it easy. So we sold the garage and the record business. And now we're going to sell the junkyard and the used car a lot. And we're going we're gonna to relax. Enjoy life a little bit. We don't give. We don't give. Now we're gonna take back. <laughs> hey, hey, was uh, Red's record yours? Yeah, Red's record, Red's automotive. Yep. Oh wow! I didn't know that. So, uh, what's his name? And there, uh, the, the welder fellow. Uh, <clears throat> welder uh, down there, number nine, and in, in uh, Edwards Road. Uh, you know him all He welds. He welds down there all the time. Uh -uh. No. Okay. He had a. Wow! I didn't know that. That's big, man. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, we had the biggest record business in town. Yeah. One of the biggest records. Yeah. yeah. Of course, I own Reds, Owen, JJ, <coughs> and then Chuck Owen too. I bought all them guys out. But we done pretty good. We grow, and sold, and. Yeah. Ready to sell the rest of it. I bought the junkyard just because I was getting so many wrecked cars that people wouldn't come back and get. And I was having to get the title to them and all that. That's why I bought the junkyard. So we'd have a place to put all that stuff. But you know, it's time to, it's time to move on, retire a little bit, and enjoy life. I want to race a little bit more than I've been doing lately. I've, I've slacked off. I want to do a little more racing. And I want to travel like I used to back across different parts of the country and cook, you know. Go to, you know, wife, she wanted to go see the football Hall of Fame. She, yeah. she loves football. Hey, you want to crazy mess with football, ain't Oh, you? man, she's a football fan. She, you know, and uh, she wanted to go to the football Hall of Fame. She begged me for years to take her, and I said, okay, we're going to go. We're going to go with We took two of the grandkids with us, and uh, we went to uh, Maryville, Ohio. Marietta, Ohio. Went to Marietta, Ohio, and cooked the barbecue contest. That's right there on the Ohio River, up going up to 77. And uh, then, when we left there, Sunday morning, got up early, and we were talking to the Football Hall of Fame. And uh, and uh, she walked in, and she looked up there and seen all them statues and stuff up there, and she said, look there, there's all my buddies. <laughs> <laughs> she thought that was fascinating, the most fascinating thing she'd ever done with the Football Hall of Fame. She knows her stats and all. Oh, all she knows and... all that stuff, you know. <laughs> I told you, Hot Rod, he'd, he'd be surprised. See, a little Japanese woman didn't know nothing about football until 1972, and then she is she is it, you know. Yeah. She's a, matter of fact, she's been a little upset about uh, Peyton Manning going to, Going and taking that job in Denver. In Denver. Uh, not Denver. Where did he go? Yeah, uh, he went to Denver. Probably. Yeah, went to Denver and then uh, they let Peyton, uh, I mean, let uh, Tebow go. She's a she's a big fan of Tebow, but she's a big fan of Carolina Panthers. She's liking Ken Newton. And she's, she's loving what's going on up there. And uh, she was fussing the other day the highest played football player in the NFL was a defensive end for. For Carolina Panthers, she thought it was somebody else, one of the big quarterback or something, but he made more money than the rest of them. So, I mean, she, but she kind of likes that because she likes the Carolina Panthers. She's a big Dallas fan, though. Yeah, I promise you, she, I don't think she'll ever get Dallas out of her heart. That's right, Lord. But she's, she's wanting to go to the Mile High Stadium. She's, she's always wanted to go to Denver. She used to love Denver. Her first football team she really liked was Denver. And uh, I don't know why. It's when old Jim Marson was playing back then, you know. Been a long time ago, back then. In the early 70s, and uh, but she's always wanted to go to my high. So maybe, maybe I'll find. What we do is we we sell all this, and we we'll buy us one of them trailers that's got a toy hauler in the back, and got the sleeper and a camper and a everything. You know, like a little house in the front. We can put a smoker in the back. And we'll head out. And we'll go to the my high stadium, cook a barbecue contest on the way out. Then go out there and hit. And then on the way back, go somewhere else, cook a little barbecue contest. She wants to go down to New Orleans and. Go to the Superdome and uh, go down and eat some 
gumbo and stuff. She loves all that. And uh, matter of fact, I made her some some real New Orleans gumbo. I learned how to cook it, dude. Make the rule and all that. And I made her some not long ago. Boy, that was a hit with her. She loved that. So she wants to travel across the country to see different things. Of course, she's been to the Hoover Dam and down. We've been down to the, to the uh, Grand Canyon, and, you know, different places down in Florida. But you know, she wants to, she wants just to hit the road and go, go up north, go up to Maine and different parts like that. You know, you know, one of them guys sent me an invitation and called me. Woman, come to uh, Rochester, New York, cook barbecue and contest. They got a, they got a KCBS, and then they got. You know, like that here, we got the Tacloma, but they got the New England Barbecue Association. And, you know, they do some weird stuff on Friday night. I mean, they have three or four categories. You know, it's like a whole other contest. Oh. And, uh, and I was reading the applications for the one up there in Rochester, and they put on there, they're going to have a, a, a white hot contest on Friday night. And, and, of course, they had three or four other contests, too, but white hot was one of them. And my buddy from Ohio was in here, and I sat there and, and I asked, uh, I asked Frank, I said, Frank, I said, you from up north? I said, up there, he's up at Port Clinton right on the Lake Erie. And I said, Frank, I said, what's a white hot? Hmm. I don't know, it might be a fish. I said, a fish? Man, a white hot. I, ain't never, I never heard of a white hot. I said, there's something missing. There's a word missing in there somewhere they put in. They put something in there. I, said, I don't know. Hey, you know. But we looked it up on the internet. You know what it is? Yeah. It's a hot dog. It's a white hot dog. It, you know, the Amish and the Germans back years ago, when they first started making hot dogs, well, they didn't want that. If it, if it didn't have smoke or it didn't have food coloring in it, it wouldn't be red. But they used different meat so it wouldn't be white. So they used pure chicken or pure pork, and it's white. And they don't put no dye and they don't smoke. And they, cook, and they put a little spice in there with it because they say it's a what? little hot. Like a hot dog, you'd think it'd be hot, you know, but it's, you know, but it's it's a it's a white hot dog. They're real expensive too. Oh wow! I gotta yeah, check them out, man. So it's a so it's a different kind of hot dog. It's white, so I, you know, it's something we don't have down here. But uh, so if most of the hot dogs didn't have all that flavor and color in it. They'd be white too. Yeah, they'd be light color. Wow. Smoke or smoke or dye. I think that's what they call it. the skin. You know, whatever. You know, when you cut it open, it's different on the inside than it is on the outside. It is, yes. And you know, and if you cook one, you ever notice you cook it, the water kind of gets the red tint to it. it it's got dye in it then. Okay. If, it's, if a, a real good hot dog is smoked, though, it's got smoke flavor to it, it you know, and the color, the color wouldn't come out of that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I, I was thinking about going up there, but that's just too far away, you know. It, we're going to Waynesboro, Georgia, and uh, do our uh, strawberry, and they got wing contest, and we got this new raspberry chipotle sauce we're using on the wings. Oh, it's wow. Off the chain. It's going to be good. Off the chain. And, of course, uh, my buddy Dean, you know, my buddy Dean, he's coming. Uh, he's, him and his wife, they moved up to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, right outside in Clarksville. And uh, he's, uh, he's coming down to be down there with me because I miss Dean. You know, he's the one to come up with the barbecued cornbread. You know, we were doing the cornbread together. And you know, well, everybody was loving that. I mean, that's still a big hit. And uh, he showed me how to cook that. And uh, I love my buddy Dean. He's, he's, he, me and him, you know, me and him and like some fun together. But I ain't seen him in a while. So he's going to come to Waynesboro. And then the next month in June, the last, I think it's towards the last weekend in June, was everyone trying is, it's two weeks after trying, we're going to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Oh, wow. And they got a contest up there in Clarksville, Fort Campbell, and it's going to be at the Speedway, and uh, and they call it the Wounded Soldier uh, Contest, and every cooker is going to get a Wounded Soldier to come and help them. So me and Dean's going to be there together doing it, and we're going to get us one of them Wounded Soldiers, and I'm going to wear this army outfit now Yay. on Saturday, <laughs> and I, I'm going to put my old green beret on, peel it over, and we're going to get out. And you know my thing is, every Saturday morning about 9 o'clock, I got Charlie Daniels doing the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, yeah. Field. Hey, we're going to get out there, and I'm going to have four camel Kentucky locking heels, baby. Look here. We're going to salute the flag and play Charlie Daniels with the, with the fiddle doing the Star Spangled Banner on Saturday morning by 9 o'clock. That's going to be off the chain yeah, at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. But I can't wait to get up there. I mean, uh, 
I can't say enough for our men and women that uh, do things, you know, that, that join the military and sacrifice, sacrifice their families and everybody else to go do what's right for our country. You can't, yes. you cannot do nothing but praise these people, you know. And uh, yeah. I don't think, I don't think we as Americans and the news reporters or whatever, we don't do enough to, to show really what they do. I mean, there's a lot of good stories that uh, that's hit the internet that never gets on the news hardly, you know, because you know they just. You know they 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 just not into that, but we ought to be into that because yes. they do a great job for our country, and I'm I'm proud of them, and I do anything for any man and woman that's in the armed forces. Armed forces. Yep. Yeah. Go out there and have a good time, and uh, be at Fort Campbell, Kentucky on the I think it's the third weekend of June. Uh, we be there. We'll be having a lot of time. It'll be a big big contest. They had last year was the first time they had it, and. Uh, I didn't know about it, so I didn't go, but this year we're going up. I think they're going to have a sausage contest on Friday night up there. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, uh, and Dean says he's a sausage expert, so we're going to find out. <laughs> we're going to find out how he knows about sausage. Yeah, I, heard yeah, I know how to make some good pork sausage to mix it up the way we used to do when we was kids, you know. And uh, they killed the hog and grind it up, and we'd mix some sage and stuff in there, but it just... It just tastes like any rest of the sausage you make, you can buy in the store, you know. But Dean said he know how to make some with some cheese and peppers and stuff. Oh, you will find out. Mm. See what they're gonna have up there. Go up there and cook barbecue with the wounded soldiers. Well, you know, you've you've lived a storied life, Red, and uh, you know I know Red's record up here in Spartanburg around this area has always been one of the largest record operations in the country, and I, I didn't know that was yours and. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you know, you got your NASCAR history, and you know, friends. When he says he's friends with all these uh, big NASCAR guys, he, I've, I've been there, and the phone rang, and, and it's one of them right on the track, calling him, saying, "Hey, this or that and the other." And uh, I've been there and seen it myself. And then, you know, big time barbecue roots. You've been all the way to Las Vegas, New York. You've, uh, you know, it's a lot of people out there that wish they could live the life you live, Red, right, Red, and. And folks, him selling this place and uh, selling all his stuff out to live, you know, the remainder of his life and enjoy it is uh, is another big piece of history because it's going to be a big change for Spartanburg County as well as uh, uh, for, you know, everybody because I know it's a big operation, a lot of people involved with Red. And uh, so, you know, we salute you and I'm so glad I came here today that we could sit down and have a talk with you and... Uh, uh, but you know, uh, uh, this is like a memorial to Red Bordner, but uh, it's not over yet. He's still got a lot of life to live. And, you know, how you're 60, but you're still feeling pretty damn good, aren't you? Oh, man, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to go, doctor. Well, you know, I have to have a physical, you know, to drive these race cars. You know, they won't let me get my license renewed, but every two years I have to take a physical. Of course, when I was flying it the same way. You had to take a, you know, a flight physical, you know, and, and that's the same thing we really got to take with this. Uh, this went to cut car, so I, I mean, I, I took a physical and I'm in great health. I mean, you know, I got to go take a new one uh, next uh, weekend after next, uh, 18th somewhere, I got to go get renewed physical, so. But I'm in good shape. I mean, I'm in great shape. I ain't going to run no marathon, that's for sure. My knees hurt a little bit, my back hurts a little bit, so I ain't going to do no running, but man, I can sit in the race car and drive all day long, you know. <laughs> and and, and uh, we, we can kick back and cook barbecue all day long, you know. Man. Yeah. Ain't no big deal. Go have a good time. You know, that's what life's about. It is. Yeah, but I think uh, I owe this to my wife, you know, when uh, when we get ready and, and crank down to go out and have a good time because she has, she has worked hard. I mean, I can't say I've done it all, that's for sure, because she has worked just as hard as I have, and she's put everything into it, as, if not more than I have, you know, into, into what we got. You know, she, she's sacrificed too, and I have too, because... Even when we was growing up and raising the kids, you know, we had to we had to really work hard, you know, to be able to send them to the music lessons and the dance lessons and the art schools and stuff, you know. So, you know, we had to work hard to make sure they had that, you know, and, and uh, it paid out. So, you know, turned out real good. It's a nice time for me and her relaxing. And then we've been. I've went cook. I went cook a lot with the grandkids. I've took them all over the country, you know. And my granddaughter, she was with me down in uh, last weekend down in uh, Greenville when we cooked down there. We came before last, and uh, 
Well, it's a blessing to see her there. She's over at Clemson and uh, trying to get her degree in engineering. And uh, but I've took the grandkids cooking with me all the way out to Memphis and Charleston, everywhere. They've won a lot of contests, and boy, we've had some good times together. And, and uh, hopefully they they'll not forget that you know as they get older. You know when they get older and and that. Teenager years, you know, they get where they go, oh, we'll help Grandpa, you know, he's, he's an old guy, you know, he ain't, he ain't doing, but, but we do have a lot of fun, and they, they go sometimes, but I hope that they'll, they'll remember what I've been teaching them and what I've showed them, and, and hopefully by, by the time they get a little older and they start having kids, and maybe they'll pick up where I'll leave off with this, you know, and I don't think I'll have no worry about none of them driving no race car, but <laughs> uh, I don't think they ain't tucked to that too good at all, you know. They, I don't think they, of course, you know, when I was their age, you know, I was, I was a pretty mean demon, you know, but, I mean, they not like that. They, they a little different than I was, and, uh, as far as speed goes, but as far as cooking, uh, you know, uh, we done a cheesecake contest, and, uh, Jonah, Jonah made a cheesecake, and, uh, he's 14, 15 years old, and, uh, he for first place with it, they cooked chili, I, I, I put all the ingredients out there for them, and they made chili down in Charleston. Two oldest grandkids, the boys did, and the boys, and they won first place with that, you know. So, you know, they got to, all they got to do is just step up to the plate when they want to, and I'll, I'll let them do the cooking. I'll sit back and shoot, breathe, and tell Joe. <laughs> <laughs> let them do the hard work. Ah, and I've done it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what life's all about at the end. Well, uh, we're going to do a bunch of shots of his uh, garage and uh, all his outfits. And, and uh, you know, uh, somebody wants to get a hold of you now. Red Border's got a great rub. We just sold another bottle of it. It's going to get out there and catch on. It is a championship rub. And uh, how can somebody, well, if you go on Barbecue Superstars, I've got it right there. You can buy it right away. But how can somebody get in touch with you, Red? Well, you, uh, you can go to, uh, uh, I got a, I got a uh, Facebook which is, uh, you can go to Kickback Co, Race and Barbecue, or Red Bordner on the, on the, uh, on the Facebook, or you, uh, we don't have a, uh, web page yet. Uh, I'm probably, as soon as we get all our sauces, we're working on get, finalizing our deal, we're getting our sauces bottled. We got, uh, three good sauces, uh, maybe four sauces we're going to bottle, and plus we got our, uh, we got our own mixture of chili bean uh, seasoning that we're going to uh, put out too. So as soon as I get all that finalized, we're going to do a web page. But our, right now, you can reach me at KC, uh, KBC Kickback Co. BBQ uh, at BellSouth.net. KBC BBQ at BellSouth.net. That's, that's my email address. Or uh, just like I say, my phone number and uh, my email address and everything's on Facebook. You know, even my phone number's on there. If you want to call, get some of my rub, uh, championship rub. We are, we're going to use it this weekend down in Georgia. Uh, hopefully, we're going to win with it. But, uh, I, I say they win first place ribs in uh, Conway. Yeah, we won first with ribs down there. And you used your championship rub then, didn't you? Yeah, we used that same rub. You sat there and watched me. Matter of fact, you filmed me. It's on the... It's on YouTube. Are you filming me rubbing Putting them together. ribs, yeah. cooking them, cutting them, and everything. That's right. I showed you everything I was doing over there. Mm -hmm. They gave away a few secrets how to call a hawk. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hawk calling champion. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I tell you, his stuff is really good. Now, Rod Lord, Hot Rod, uh, he tried your blueberry uh, sauce. You know, he still talks about that. And, uh, uh, I tell you, his his work with blueberries and uh, different fruits in his rubs, which a lot of people are going to that, but Red, Red's got a little, he's, he's perfected it. And uh, most of his mm -hmm. stuff is based around that fruit, uh, the fruits. And uh, so, you know, I challenge you, give it a try. You know, get in touch with Red and uh, get yourself some of these sauces. And uh, I guarantee you it'll raise your game. And you do anything but one night and you throw some of that on there, a lot of these other guys will be like, what happened? Because uh, then y'all done one and walked off with it, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh. well, uh, we're gonna get in here and uh, shoot around, and get all these pictures. And uh, Red, you want to say any any last words to your family, the people who's gonna see it? 
Oh yeah, I just want to tell all y'all that uh, if y'all ain't met me, anytime you see me on the road come up, I ain't no stranger to nobody. And uh, I, got, uh, I got a wonderful family, a wonderful wife, two kids, uh, six, seven, eight grandkids. You know, we got a bunch of grandkids. They're all good, friendly. You know, come on up, sit down and just talk with us. We'll, we'll, we'll share stories, you know. I, I never meet a stranger, you know. I, I love people, so, you know. Uh, and uh, just keep your eye out and uh, watch my web, uh, my Facebook page. I always post it where I'm going and uh, just come on out and see us. Come on, hang out. Have a good time. Cook, eat. You know, we, we always there doing something. So come on, hey, hang out with us. Tell you what, every time I ever went, I really enjoyed myself. And, uh, oh, yeah, we're going to have fun. You'll have that NASCAR sitting out there beside his trailer. And uh, it's just hard to tell what old Red might be doing, and it's a lot of fun. And, well, we appreciate everybody coming by, and uh, you know, I, I just want to thank you, Red, for allowing me to come down and do this interview with you. And I feel like Barbecue Superstar just got a big piece of good combination of NASCAR and barbecue history. And, uh, and uh, of course, you know, we'll be following you in the future. And I'm sure uh, once you get out there heavy on the circuit, we'll be down there in the middle of oh, yeah. all the stuff you're doing. So. Uh, well, this is Daryl from Barbecue Superstars, uh, trying to bring the very best of everything there is out there. And Red Border of Kickback Code definitely is one of those very best. And uh, we'll be coming at you with more stuff. So for this uh, portion of Barbecue Superstars of Kickback Code, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Man, that was good. Oh, yeah, that's good. What I want to do is... Uh...